Okay, everybody, thank you so much for your patience. We had to get some technical expertise up here to help us get the computer going. Uh, so we're opening a little late, but that's Hora Latina, so we're fine. Everybody's happy, I hope. Uh, it's my great, great pleasure today to introduce my friend and respected colleague, Maria Elisa Velasquez, to be our annual speaker for the Black Atlantic Seminar. Uh, sponsored by the Robert Penn Warren Center next door, where there will be a reception afterwards, so I hope you'll join us. Uh, this program on the Black Atlantic was established five years ago, and it's a spin-off from the Warren Center's Circum Atlantic uh, Study Seminar that's now 10 years old, which I co-direct with Celso Castillo, who's in the back. Um, and we want to gratefully acknowledge the support of Mona Frederick, the Executive Director of the Robert Penn Warren Center, uh, and Administrative Assistant Allison Thompson that you just saw up here, and also the Bishop Joseph Johnson Center for allowing us every year to have the events here. So we're very grateful for that support. Maria Elisa Velasquez is a researcher at the National Institute of Anthropology and History in Mexico, INA. She also teaches at the National School of Anthropology and History, and she's the first woman elected president of the UNESCO International Committee on the Slave Route, Resistance, Liberty, and Heritage Project. Her research focuses on people of African heritage in Mexico, and she edits a series called Africania. She has many wonderful works, and I wish I'd remembered to bring a few to show, but um, one, one of them, I'll mention several of them. Juan Correa, Free Mulatto and Master Painter uh, in 1988, so she's worked a lot with images like our colleague Catherine Molyneux in the back. Women of African Origin in the Capital City of New Spain, 17th and 18th Centuries, 2006. The Black Footprint in Guanajuato, Portraits of Afro-Descendants in the 19th and 20th Centuries, 2007. So you're moving through time, huh? <laughs> She's organized also many, many wonderful conferences on the African history and heritage in Mexico, and then she edits the collections resulting from those conferences, and she just delivered us some today that Paul Lovejoy, one of our featured speakers tomorrow, and David Huid, another speaker tomorrow, and myself. We're lucky enough to go to that conference in Veracruz, and those works just have appeared, so we're grateful. That work is called Contemporary Historical Debates on Africans and Afro-Descendants in Mexico and Central America. Now, Maria Lisa, you may have also seen, uh, because she's been a consultant on many, many different book and documentary projects, and recently you may have seen the Henry Louis Gates series for PBS, Blacks in Latin America, and Maria Lisa was part of that big conference and did this, the episode on Mexico. Uh, of course, she's also appeared in television productions in Canada, France, El Salvador, Guatemala, Brazil, so somewhere you will have seen her, and now you see her in person. Uh, in addition to these many wonderful things, she's also been recognized uh, last year in 2011 with the Gonzalo Aguirre Beltran Award. For those of you who may not know, he was the foremost uh, uh, scholar of Africans in Mexico and sort of launched our field there. Uh, that was issued by the government of Veracruz. And she's also an honorary member of the uh, American, oh, excuse me, the Academic Institution of History in El Salvador. And today she's going to speak to us, as you can see, Africans and Afro-descendant women in Mexico City during colonial times, social relationships and cultural reproduction. So welcome, Maria Elisa Velasquez. Thank you very much to Jane for her presentation. And thank you very much for you to being here. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank uh, Vanderbilt University, particularly Professor Jane Landers, my friend and my, and my uh, um, partner or of uh, research of these subjects, for inviting me to participate in this seminar. It's an honor to be with you. Uh, I have special interest in sharing thoughts of Mexico's Africans and people of African descent in the United States. For many years, along the U.S. researchers, I have insisted on the need uh, uh, for those of us with an interest in this subject to undertake academic exchange, read the results of, of one another's research, and become familiar with the different approaches that we use. 
It is, I think, the only way to enrich our research and make us capable of offering Mexican people, in particular those of African descent, the tools they need in order to become acquainted with their past and face today's challenge. Many times scholars of the United States work by themselves and we don't have really uh, exchange between the results of the uh, American res uh, uh, researchers and the Mexicans one. One of the problem is that we, uh, to, to the United States, never come the books that we publish in English. So that's uh, quite a problem. In this presentation, I will talk about some of the central results of my main research about African and Afro-descendant women in Mexico City during colonial times. Also, um, as I'm part of the scientific committee of the International Slave Route Project of UNESCO, I will broadly explain at the last uh, different aspects of this, of its uh, development, achievements, and goals for the, incoming, for the coming years. Before I begin, I would like to apologize of my faulty English. I'm not very good, but I will try to make my lecture as clear and understandable as possible. So I will have to read a little bit. Uh, I will ask you your passions, because I'm not very good, but I will, I will do my best. As most of us know, since the 16th century, during the colonial period, Mexico, as in the case of other American countries, received thousands of Africans, the majority of whom were slaves and were brought by force throughout the course of nearly three centuries. The participation of women, men, and children of Senegambia and Central Africa, among other Africans, as well as that of their descendants, was a decisive factor in Mexico's economy, social, and cultural development. It is estimated that approximately 250,000 Africans were introduced into the country, in addition to those that arrived via contraband operations and those who were born in Mexico, number of which is very difficult to estimate. Figures revealed by researchers of the subject, especially from Aguirre Beltran, that uh, during the second half of the 16th century and the first decades of the 17th, Mexico received a greater number of African people that, need, that did all other Hispanic countries. In fact, if we look closely, at the numbers of African and Afro-descendants in Mexico, we will found that they were the second group in importance after the native population, which always, even with the great demographic catastrophe, was bigger. So let's see some, uh, some um, amounts. So you can see this one, it's uh, from the 16th uh, century. This was uh, made by uh, Gonzalo Aguirre Beltran, the pioneer historian. And uh, you can see, of course, that the indigenous people were the most highest, and the Africans were the second, the second group. And since those times, uh, uh, the mix between, mostly between indigenous and Africans, were uh, the third group. This is another one of uh, middle of 17th century, and you can see, well, that uh, the catastrophe, the demographic catastrophe was very important, and uh, you can see also how the African people uh, increase, and of course, the mix between uh, the groups. We don't have exactly uh, amounts for the 18th century, because in, in that time, uh, uh, it was difficult to find out census uh, that are okay to, to tell us the amount, but we have an idea, of course, that it was the same uh, kind of numbers that in uh, the middle of the 17th century, increasing, of course, the mixed in groups. The participation of women, men, and children uh, 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 were central for the construction of Mexican society. 
the experience of slaves, men and women, throughout the nearly 300 years of Spanish colonial rule were complex and heterogeneous, much as was the whole of society in New Spain. Slavery in Mexico share certain traits with other countries, although it also possessed some singular characteristic. It was not the same to be a slave on a sugar plantation located in the Gulf region of Veracruz, and it was to be a domestic servant in Mexico City or a slave in a hospital located in the coastal region of Acapulco. Nor was it the same to be a slave during the 17th century as during the mid 18th century. So the, the thing of, of the history of slavery in Mexico, and I think it's for all the countries, is that we have to understand time and space to really appreciate the experience of these people. In this presentation, I will reflect on the importance of the role played by both enslaved and free women of African origin in Mexico in the building of social networks and cultural reproduction of Mexico City as part of New Spain. Toward the end of the 17th century, the parents of Juan Correa, the famed and accomplished mulatto painter of Baez Regal, Mexico, lent their son, Jose, 300 Mexican pesos in order for him to buy the freedom of his wife, Tomasa Gutierrez, and 50 pesos to ensure the freedom of their grandson, who was also enslaved. It was more or less during the same period that in 1688, Juan Correa sold his black slave to the Mexico City School for 235 pesos. By then, the mulatto painter, the one that painted many paintings, especially this one, I bring this one, but he has a lot of them. He was one of the most productive uh, painter in, in, in the 17th century. The mulatto painter had managed to achieve an important social and economic position. He was the maestro, the overseer of the painter's guild, and an appraiser, in addition to the fact that he and the members of the workshop had worker, worked on religious pieces for church, convents, homes, and school throughout the entire country. How was Juan Correa able to achieve this social standing and recognition. How was that he sold the black slave he had as a servant, while at the same time his brother sought the support of their parents in order to obtain the freedom of his wife and son. Thank to research done over at least the last 25 years, we know that by the 17th century, Africans and their descendants were an heterogeneous group, which is to say they experienced wide ranges of social and economic conditions. Sources have shown that initially some formed part of the Spanish conquerors militia and later were employed as slaves in mines, sugar plantations, and haciendas, the large uh, farms. We also know that throughout the vice regal period, they work both as emancipated and enslaved laborers in woolen textile mills and in craft and art workshops, becoming accomplished painters like Juan Correa, architects or singers. Their role in domestic labor has also been documented, particularly as domestic servants, cooks, wet nurses, healers, and midwives. Moreover, we know that descendants of Africans were employed as foremen, that they participate in the militia, often holding important posts in strategic ports such as Veracruz and Acapulco, and that many were cattle drivers or merchants, that uh, this kind of jobs uh, allow them, to some of them, to uh, amass significant fortunes. A high percentage obtained their freedom and improved their living conditions, while others went on living in conditions of subjugation and subordination, mainly on the haciendas, in the plantation system. On the other hand, sources testify that Africans and their descendants, both male and female, create groups that fostered allegiance and solidarity via networks based on familiar ties 
or common lines of work, such as guilds, while some groups took shape as rebel movements. Ties of solidarity among families or domestic communities existed, but the expression of cultural loyalty to a given ethnic or racial group as such was not the norm. This could explain why Juan Correa sold his slave rather than granting her freedom. Nevertheless, by the end of the 18th century, there were few slaves in New Spain. Many of them have opportunities to obtain their freedom and marriage and mix with other indigenous or another kind of groups. With the exceptions, of course, of uh, regions like Veracruz, Morelos, and Hidalgo, that they still have uh, slaves until the 18th uh, century. Let's see if I have, well, here is a, a detail of the same uh, painting. This painting, it's in the, in the Museum of Art in, the, in Mexico City. And this is also important because Juan Correa painted this image uh, showing the color of, of, of course, of him, of the family. And uh, he did it in, 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 several, in several paintings. So that's also important because uh, nobody make a, a, a problem about painting that kind of angels uh, and uh, uh, in this kind of image that were in, in churches, in convents, or in particular houses. Despite laws and ordinance that attempted to regulate relationships among the diverse, diverse groups, Mexico became a society characterized by physical and cultural exchange. The renowned phrase, bear in mind but not obey, that still works today, was reflected in nearly all environments, thus enabling opportunities for social and economic mobility. Hence, segregation and discrimination var varied in terms of their application during a given historical period and region. For example, in 1702, Francisco de Cejas y Lovera, a Spanish government official, stated the following with regard to family relationships in New Spain. And I quote, this was the the phrase, because much more than in Spain, families are numerous and, regardless of their mobility, are prone to having many black and mulatto relatives. Hence, even the most worldly from those parts cannot escape being ordinary. An anonymous painting, let's see. Mm -hmm. An anonymous painting, which I found some years back, helps to illustrate the social order of New Spain. Painted toward the end of the 18th century, it offers unique information of the activities that took place in the Galleon of China Fur, particularly on the diverse activities and social positions of Africans and their descendants in Acapulco. Since it shows Slaves, slaves, merchants, members of the militia, servants, and cattle drivers. This is a big painting, and it's difficult to see the whole thing, but I brought some pictures that you can see some details of the painting, and you can see the diverse uh, positions that the African and Afro-descendants have in this, in this, uh, uh, in Acapulco, in the port of Acapulco. So here we, we see them. Uh, taking, carrying a Spanish man. But also, uh, uh, you can see the Africans like slaves that they were sold, uh, sold in, in, the, in the fur of China. This is a very strange scene. I even never see it described in documents. So I was so impressed to find this picture because you can see, well, they are, they are selling the slaves uh, as part of all the other merchancies that they have. And also it's a proof, a testimony, that we have commerce between the Pacific and that slaves came to this port 
uh, uh, even in this time that it's uh, late, in, late uh, 18th century. And also you can see that there is a, a white man that it's uh, uh, maybe of course Spanish, but also a mulatto that it's part of the negotiations of the slaves. I don't know why he's so, okay. This is another detail of the painting. You can see the ceramic, the porcelains that, were, that came that they were so, uh, uh, so nice and so precious for the Spanish people, for the novel nov Spanish people. But also you can see there, well, uh, uh, a young slave, a children carrying a tibor of ceramic, but also one that it's in the horse that it's uh, of the milicia. So also it shows you the different uh, parts of the of the dynamic social relations. Mm -hmm. In this complex and contradictory society, there existed great economic inequalities, discriminations, and prejudice. But alongside of the possibility for cultural exchange, mixing, and certain social or economic mobility. In this process, women of African origin, both enslaved and free, played a decisive role. Many of them work in the haciendas, for example, in the sugar making refineries that multiplied in states such as Morelos and Veracruz, among other tasks, cutting sugar, cane, and piling it. Their intervention, intervention in the regional economy, although largely unrecognized by historiography, was relevant not only in the haciendas, but also in the guild workshops and in formal and informal commerce. In cities such as Mexico, the great majority of these women work as domestic servants, cooks, and wet nurses. All of these works were intimately linked with the daily lives of their employers, the majority of whom were Spanish or criollo. Also, some of them were mestizo and mulatto or black. For example, a testament that I came across in Mexico National General Archive reveals that in 1630, a free African Wolof by the name of Vicente Saucedo from Mexico City had among his possessions a male mulatto slave and a black female slave. He, he was a free Wolof that, uh, that was available to have slaves itself. It's, it, itself. Another file from 1631 from the notary archive testifies to the fact that the free mulatta Catalina de la Cruz, also from Mexico City, sold her black 20 years old female slave from Angola named Isabel to Diego Torres Velasquez. He was not my, my uh, family, of course, for 400 pesos in gold. The price of this African woman shows the value of a slave in a, ma in a major cities at the time. It is worth mentioning that according to the 1753 census, the number of mulatta women who participate in a broad range of financially remunerated activities, particular, particularly those involved in domestic service in Mexico City, was superior to the indigenous women. So also that's, uh, that's important, that the value of the woman in, in sometimes in Mexico City, in some periods, was uh, uh, really very, very high. Like this woman that was 400. Most of the slaves were, depends also the period, the, the region, but they were like 200, 300, less, more. But this is a, 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 a very important value for a woman slave. In their day-to-day -day shores, alongside women from all social and cultural groups, African and Afro-descendants played a key role in cultural exchange. They were in charge of the child reading and the cooking, and they exchanged on a daily basis with their employers, whether these be the household members of private ha homes, guild workers in the workshops, the nuns in the convents, or priests in the church. For example, 
the tax of nursing the children became so, so, uh, became so widespread that some European chroniclers who traveled to Mexico during this period spoke poorly of this practice, given that their chauvinism led them to believe that through the milk, the chichiwas, these women, chichiwas, it's the name for the women that take care of the little babies and they give the, the milk, chichiwas from Nahuatl, chichi, pass uh, with the milk the, the bad habits. The fact is that many of these women obtained their freedom through the manumisations of their masters in acknowledgement of their care and good reading of the master's children. Furthermore, and according to testimonies recorded in Mexico City Catholic Paris registers, women of African descent were the group of damsels most open to intermarriage with the rest of the population, especially with criollo and Spanish men. Well, I will, I will uh, show you some image that, uh, that in the paintings um, shows the, 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 this kind of works. This is a painting that we name Ex Boto, that is when you uh, pass an accident or suffering some uh, illness and you are grateful and so you make a painting to give, uh, to say, uh, thank you to a virgin or some devotion. So this is in Oaxaca, and it's uh, after a earthquake. Uh, but the interesting thing is that this is the, the woman that is uh, taking care of the little children, and it's presenting, you see, like he's presenting all the things, how it's happening. And uh, they thank her because she helped to take out the babies and the, and the woman in, in all this uh, problem. This is of 18th century, and this painting is in the Museum of the Soledad in, in Oaxaca. This is another detail of a Biombo painting and, uh, of 17th century, that you can see the two Spanish women and the, the, the two uh, servants, maybe slaves or free, we don't know, they are walking behind them. And this is the same Biombo of the 17th century. I like this scene very much because you can see the relationships between all the groups in Mexico City. This is a detail of the, of the uh, downtown uh, city. You can see the, the African woman, the, the indigenous, the mulata, and the, little, and the little children. And they are, all of them, they are, you know, having a daily life and exchanging things and buying things. This is another of the same Biombo, and you can see the African woman uh, talking with the Spanish that maybe it's uh, buying all the, all the products of daily life, and the indigenous in the other side also. And uh, this is also uh, an example, a little example of the, of the painting um, pictures of the gender of um, casta paintings. And also you can see the African and Afro-descendants woman taking care of a lot of uh, commerce things in the, in, the, in the public streets of Mexico City. Well, witchcraft, marriage, and superstition were also practiced that implied transmission and cultural reproduction about African and Afro-descendants. Although these expressions were carried out by all cultural groups of New Spain, since indigenous women were excluded from the Inquisition code of law, the population of African origin, and particularly women and slaves, became social victims, like in Mexico we say, chivos expiatorios, often accused at the, the holy office. For example, in the 17th century, Cecilia, this is a map of Acapulco, so we go back a little bit to Acapulco port. A slave from Acapulco was accused before the Inquis Inquisition for predicting when the Manila and Peru galleons from the southeast would dock. As was the case each year, it was expected that the ashen ships would arrive carrying highly valued silks, porcelains, and pearls, as well as some renowned passengers, wealthy men, members of the clergy, or, as we saw, slaves, 
that were sold at the port. The importance of the event was such that the bells of the Mexico City Cathedral announced the arrival of the Galeons so the merchants and muleteers could prepare for the journey to the Pacific coast and make the necessary arrangements for the transport and sale of merchandise. According to a statement issued by a neighbor, Cecilia, who worked at the Royal Hospital located at the port of Acapulco, often guessed correctly when predicting how much time would pass before the next galleon was to arrive, the accidents or problems faced by the crew during the journey, and who was to arrive on the ship. The claims also include her of guessing the location of certain mines or ancient treasures that indigenous groups had hidden in the area. Several of the slaves in Acapulco were accused of the same crime to, to, to manage with, with witchcraft. As in many of these cases, Cecilia was not processed, perhaps because church authorities did not believe the accusations were important. Many of the, of the, of the, the, the cases of accusa accusations, demands in the accusations never proceed. We can see the demand, but we, um, a lot of times we don't know what happened before, after, I mean. But, however, this account reveals, among other things, but because it's very interesting, the document, the importance that the slaves' powers of these women could acquire among the members of the community, that they, they have expectations, because, of course, you know, they, only, they don't only have to deal with hand, uh, witchcrafts of these kind of things, but also to, to make things, to, to take the lovers of the man or to help uh, for the healthy of some, uh, somebody or things like that. Divination, healing, or witchcrafts were practices that many female slaves made use of throughout the colonial period in order to acquire a certain degree of power or earn money just as were strategies in their relationships with other groups with the purpose of securing a better life and often seeking to obtain economic benefits or a certain degree of power. The documentation also reveals resistance to subordination, ill treatment, and the imposed order of things, as well as forms of cultural reproduction. Many expressions of magic and witchcraft of African and Afro-descendants in New Spain probably form part of their cultural background and were passed on from one generation to the next. Others were more likely learned or recreate as a result of their merging with local indigenous beliefs and with the superstitions, of course, and witchcrafts practiced as well by European inhabitants. We, we, when we see these kind of documents, we always see uh, involve uh, Spanish women, also indigenous that give the, the herbals or the things and the Africans. So this was also a way to, to uh, have uh, relations of cultural practice. Other important issue to talk about is the way the African and Afro-descendant women of colonial Mexico fought as slaves or free women to get better life conditions for themselves and their children. There are many cases that shows how the slave women tried from the time their children were born to gain their freedom. For example, there is a document that confirms that in 1724, Marcos Jimenez de Leinares, a merchant and a neighbor from the city of Santiago de, of Querétaro, in Querétaro they were also a lot of Africans, granted the freedom of two months old mulatillo, two months old mulatillo by the name of Pedro Vicente that had been born in this house. The newborn was the son of a slave mulata that belonged to the merchant who paid 60 gold pesos for the freedom of his son the mother paid. In the document, the owner gave his testimony of having received the money and according to the custom of having given the savings and freedom from slavery and captivity to the mulatillo Vicente. 
Despite the fact that the legal procedures needed for emancipation were formally simple and did not require that the subject appear in court, many female slaves had to fight for the freedom and had been granted to them in testaments, although the ex executors or hers had not respected the testaments. For example, in 1687, Rosa Maria from Mexico City presented a claim for not having obtained her freedom pursuant to a clause contained in her master testament while she remained in the home of another person until the dispute was resolved. Other slaves present claims against religious institutions that have presage and power to obtain the freedom to, wh to which they had a right. Among others, in 1604, a black female slave from the San Jerónimo convent in Mexico City. According to the documentation from the claim, the slave had been freed by a clause included in the testament under the condition that she pay half of her sale price, which totaled 100 pesos. Given that she didn't have this amount of money she was purchased by another master who, according to her statement, had put her to work as a servant for his daughters who were nuns in the San Jerónimo convent, agreeing to pay her a salary against the sum needed to guarantee her freedom. According to Andrea Velasco, she had worked as a servant for 20 years and hence asked that her slavery and service that's the way she said, be paid in order to obtain her freedom. The authorities made the corresponding request in order to notify the nuns and mother superior involved of Andrea's claim for freedom. The, the haughty temperament and singular style of dressing practice by black and mulatta women were also expressions that set them in a singular praise place from another woman from Mexico City. In uh, uh, um, a painting of, by Arellano, that's the name of this paint, painter, we don't know, but we think he was mulatto, the one that made this painting also, uh, um, Paint this mulata in 1711. This piece is the oldest known painting within the casta paintings, kind of painting is the oldest that, that we found, well, that it's been founding, and belongs to the Denver Museum major, major collection. It's a beautiful painting. The clothing worn by the woman and the jewels that she used bring to mind the critical comments made by, by some Europeans that visit Mexico City uh, that, re that make reference to the exaggerate and dishonest way in which African and Afro-descendants women dress. So they use, uh, uh, in, the, in the ordinance, in the norms, they say that they cannot use pearls or jewels, but they put them. But, uh, and also they use this kind of, um, of saya, I don't know, like a cap, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and uh, I always say that this picture, for me, it's a kind of, uh, of example of the mis mixing between indigenous and African women. It's like a kind of classic mulata Mexican woman. Um, the, famous, the famous series of paintings about a mixing of groups named uh, the Casta paintings and the Mestizaje paintings revealed the way in which women of African origin were perceived toward the mid 18th century. For example, in one of them, this one that we are, that we are looking, we see a Spanish male and an African female in the company of their son or daughter, it depends, most of the time is a daughter. As in the case with many other images, the African females appears making chocolate. This is also very interesting, but it will have another presentation of one hour. 
So I will wait, uh, Jane invites me again so I can tell it. Because it is amazing how the chocolate was always associated in these paintings with the African and Afro-descendants woman. And the chocolate is um, it's, uh, an American, a Mexican product. And we don't, we don't see them, the indigenous. So I make a, a whole article talking about why are the, the things. And there are uh, several things. One of them have to be also, uh, had to do also with the, uh, with the sexual attributes that the chocolate have, but also that uh, many of them were accused in the Inquisition to do so, some kind of witchcraft with, uh, uh, with the chocolate they give like servants to the masters or to the, to the men. As in the case uh, uh, with other images, the African female appears making chocolate, as I was saying, and arguing with the Spanish male. That is also amazing because in most of the Casta paintings, uh, the indigenous women and the, and the Spanish, they are always kind of more uh, subsmeep, quiet, and obvious. And uh, the African and Afro descendants are more proud, more unruly, defined, and proud. So I think that it's also interesting because among uh, uh, they they do these paintings showing well what had, what can happen if you have a relation with an African woman, but also it shows uh, that these African women have their own character, their own pride, uh, uh, their own way to be. So to conclude this part. Um, um, I think the participation of women of African origin in Mexico was essential in the building of social networks and in the cultural reproduction of Mexican society. Through their daily work and their input in the shaping of domestic communities, they recreate the characteristic of their original cultures and create new forms of identification that it's still possible to distinguish today. There are many kind of, 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 of practice, and many of them, of course, in the Costa Chica uh, of Guerrero and Oaxaca, that we can see still this kind of, of uh, for example, associations between the character, the temper, the, 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 the way they are, the way they dress, and, and these uh, stereotypes that we have till, uh, still in um, colonial times. So uh, I will I will speak five minutes about uh, the, the some general things about the the UNESCO International Project of the Slave Route and uh, the goals uh, that we have like committee for the next uh, years. Uh, surely many of you know that this project was created in 1994 by petition of several countries, especially for, from IT. The idea was then to break the silence about the topic of slaves, slavery, and ways of uh, subjection that, subjection that had endured society, especially during the period of transatlantic slavery. One of the main objectives was to promote the research and teaching of the experience and consequence of slavery that millions of men, women, and children from different parts of Africa cultures suffered. In 2009, uh, the project was evaluated and considered that his, its existence was still valid, even through some recommendations were made among them to create mechanisms and strategies to consolidate and reinforce the communications and the works of the committee, to expand their activities to up till then forgotten regions, and to incorporate new topics and fields of study on slavery. To attend to these notifications, the number of members was reduced from 44 to 20. This committee uh, have specialists from many countries, but if you imagine 44, still we are 20 and it's a lot of problems to get together, but when they were 44, it was very difficult. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the committee was reduced, improving regional representations and incorporating new fields of study, such as the Indian Ocean, Asia, and Arabia. On the other hand, to consolidate files, 
data and information, we begin to organize an atlas that will appear online. That's what they tell you, at, they tell us at least. Uh, accessible in different languages, showing sites and significant places of memory and slavery and the slave trade as well as the aspect of immaterial heritage that were developed during the process. So the new strategies that the project uh, has the purpose in, in, in these days is one, to study in greater depth slavery and the slave trade, two, to develop educational materials for the teaching and discussion of the subject. That is the main issue. The, the committee have, uh, have done a lot of reflection about the importance to give more uh, studies of Africa in all the educational process. Uh, three, to make known and make emphasis on, on the multiply contributions of, that Africa gave the world through the millions of persons that left during the different periods of commerce to the Africa, to the Americas and other world regions. Also, this is a main problem because in our countries we don't know anything about Africa, at least in Mexico, nothing at all. To promote the lives that's the fourth one, to promote the lives, cultures, and art, as well as the spiritual expressions that result from slavery and the slave trade. Five, to preserve the archives and the oral traditions related to these two phenomena. The, the work that are doing here with uh, Jane, it's wonderful, also Paul Lovejo, of course, all these of uh, of uh, taking care of the archives and, and making them able to, to see for the students. Uh, also to create an inventory and to preserve the material cultural heritage, sites of memory vinculate to the slave trade and slavery, promoting the cultural tourism based on this inheritance. That's also an important project, that they want to make uh, these itinerary sites of, of memory of the slavery, so the people, the, 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 the tourism, but also the, the kids, know when they travel which sites were important, not only the monuments for the big politics and all that we have, but the monuments and, uh, and, uh, and that remind us about this kind of process, the people who work to build uh, our countries. The new strategies plan to extend the perspective of the Slave Root Project to the Arab world, to Asia and the Pacific, and the Andean Americas. They are also, we are very uh, worried about to know more about Chile, Argentine, Uruguay, this part of the Americas. Uh, the strategies place emphasis on the importance that should be given to the psychological effects of slavery and to the transmission of knowledge from African cultures to the rest of the world, and of course to the fight against racism and discrimination, problems intrinsically related to the slave slavery issue. That's also a, a work that we cannot forget, that the discrimination and racism still it's uh, a debt we have of this process and we have to work for it. As part of the scientific committee since 2009 and uh, now as president of the same, I have the purpose of pushing forward and of strength, strengthening the activities of the project in Mexico. Because in Mexico we have research, but we have a lot of publicity and educational things we have to do. I think that we should have more initiatives in educational aspects as well as in promoting the knowledge through the different media and collaborations with other institutions. We have, for example, started to work with the National Council for the Prevention of Discrimination with authorities of the Secretary of Education so that the theme of slavery and of the African contribution is taken, taken into account. We have also worked on creating an awareness of the government employees to create campaigns against racism, to build museums and exhibitions, as well as other activities, given that the subject of the participation of the populations of African origin in Mexico is still disregarded and little known. 
During the last two years, the participants of the international project of UNESCO have tried to improve and make more um, easy the relations of the committee and to promote research spreading of knowledge and teaching of this subject in our regions. The work is not easy because uh, we are on paid delegates and thus the project's activities are joined with those that each of us have to do in our respective countries and institutions. We have a lot of work so it's very difficult to try to have also a time to dedicate to the, to the project. However, I believe that significant ac ac achievements have been accomplished. For example, I only will, will show you an example. It had been decided, uh, because in the last meeting we have a lot of discussion, discussion uh, to add a subtitle to the name of the project, because it was the root of the slave. Which even, it seems, as an easy tax, implies negotiations and collaborations, not only among the members of the committee, but within the UNESCO itself. We only want to put a subtitle and at least it takes us two, uh, like eight hours of, of meetings to decide it. It was incredible. Uh, um, last September, the subtitle purpose by the committee was accepted, also in UNESCO, adding to the name of Slave Root, the one that uh, Jane uh, read, that it's resistance, freedom, and heritage, which, in the committee's view, is a reflection of the series of process and consequence of slavery among the people. On the other hand, uh, there is a book in process of publication coordinated by Nellie Smith and Paul Lovejoy that will make a general reflection of the investigations taking place in each region as well as a current situation of the subject regarding education and promotion of knowledge. And the plan is that this book will be also in, in, in internet so we, we, we can be able to see it in the, in the line. There have also been initiatives for the elaboration of memory sites, as I was saying, that will help in the in identification and spreading of the subject, as well as the participations of members of the committee, of course, in Congress, councils, and organizations in national and international levels. Also, uh, last December, the United Nations uh, declared the next 10 years, the years, the 10 years of the Afro-descendants people. This last year, 2011, 2011, was uh, the, 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 the year, the international year for Afro-descendants populations. But in December, they also agree to declare the next 10 years the Afro-descendants population. So, uh, for us, it's a great opportunity to increase uh, the research, of course, uh, and the uh, publicity of this subject. Well, so uh, I think that with this small uh, summary of the objectives, goals, and strategies of the committee, I can end uh, this presentation. I think I take more time than that it was planned. Um, I would like to finish only making emphasis uh, what we were talking before uh, about the importance of knowing the experience related to people of African origin in the Americas, uh, especially those of women, with the idea of analyzing and understanding them according to the different periods and contexts. Only by knowing the shades, the difference, and the similitudes can racism and discrimination be fought. The underestimation and the neglect of the contributions of these millions of people, of these millions, uh, hundreds of women, so that more inclusive, respectable, and democratic societies can be developed uh, in our countries uh, like Mexico, of course. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Maria Elisa. And maybe you have the time to take questions. Yes, yeah, sure.
showed us so many examples of life in the 18th century documenting people's existence, right? When do you think it was that historians of Mexico started rendering those people invisible? That's an excellent question. I think there are two processes. The mixing that begin to, to make forgot the, the importance of African people in Mexico, but also the project of the mestizaje that was, uh, that began in the 18th century, but was very powerful in the 19th century. And the ideas of racism at the same time that I think they really come uh, important, became, become important in 19th, 18th and 19th century. Before, of course, in colonial times, we have certain prejudice, but never the ideas of racism that develop in the 19th century, like these scientific things. So in Mexico, they began to, to, to forget about it because all the prejudice, prejudice, I think, and the idea of mestizaje to join the country into these big, glorific uh, groups that were Spanish and Indians. And so uh, it's this ideological um, process. And also, of course, uh, the Africans arrive in an important way until the 17th century. So the mixing was very quickly, so we cannot see physical uh, uh, in, the, in the color of the skin and this kind of thing so easy. But that doesn't mean that still nowadays we can see them. We can see them the ones that we know, but the ordinary people don't recognize them. So this is a, a process of mixing between the groups and also of the prejudice, racism ideas that came and that uh, arrive and uh, uh, forgot this presence. For example, uh, Clavijero, in his uh, history, that it was the first history of Mexico, he said, of course, we have two big important branches that it's uh, roots, that it's the, the Indians and the, and the Spanish, and of Africans, we didn't have. We have a little ones, few ones, because this race is not, uh, it's not a good one for our countries. So since that time, they began to deny this important um, participation. Difference. Well, that's a, uh, that would have to be a work, and we have a student that is trying to do it. Because many times, for example, uh, for, for Juan Correa, they know it years ago, many years ago, everybody knew Juan Correa, but they never knew he was mulatto until they begin to, to make research about his life. They went to the archives and they found out he was a mulatto. And then with all the documentary things that they, that they show, they found out that they were a network of paintings, of mulatto paintings and some of them. So there is not a specific work about that, but I think it will be important. Now, the paintings, the Casta paintings and all the paintings in colonial period, they repeat the same um, model. You know, like the famous painter, like Correa or then Cabrera or Villalpando, they make a painting and then the other ones repeat the same model. It was not a problem to repeat in those times, you know. It was just right. So many models are repeat. So it's difficult to find out, but I, I think it will be a great uh, research to try to distinguish. Mm -hmm. No, I, 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 I did an article, I did a little research that I will publish maybe the next year. 
it's a, a history very amazing. I went to the Fort of Acapulco to the museum. I, I go very frequently and I see, because I am fighting because they don't have any place for the African history in that museum. All of them are Spanish and Filipinos, all of them. And when you go out, all the people are black. <laughs> no? but, but in the museum, all of them of Acapulco were Philippines or Spanish. So I saw the painting and I was amazed and I went with the director and he told me, no, a, co a private collector, collectioner give us to show it, but I think it's, uh, it's from the last century, it's modern. And I say, it, that's impossible. I saw it, I know a little bit because I work a lot of years in a museum like curator. So then I went with a, a person that make a, a proof and everything, and I found that it was an 18th century painting, but uh, they sell the painting to an American, and we don't know where is the painting. Mm -hmm. I have all the, the, the photographs about the painting. That's why I want to publish the book, to, to show it. And, well, I tried to make research because uh, many in that, in 18th century, when they were doing the expeditions or, or when they went to, to, to Acapulco, they made paintings about the things. So I think it's not a very good painting you show that it's one, that it's not a professional, but it's something, somebody that it was interesting in, 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 in reflecting all that. So yes, it's a wonderful painting and um, I, I want to publish the article I was trying to, I was beginning the research, but I have to do a little more. Yes, and then. Um, in colonial times, was there a relationship between casta or status uh, and uh, Catholic Brotherhood, Hermandades? Uh, I know that, that, that was very important in, in the formation of uh, what would be racial and ethnic identity in Brazil, and I was wondering if something similar happened in Mexico. Yes, they have. They, ha they, they have uh, cofradías of negros, of mulatos, of course. And, in, and even they have one that um, Nicole von Guten find out, a uh, scholar from, from Oregon in Mexico City that was all only of, of African sapes. So in the 17th century, I think. So yes, but also they were um, cofradías of uh, mulatos and negros or mulatos and mestizos. I mean, they were not only uh, between castas. You know? So that become more in the 18th century, before it was of, uh, of, of different groups. And it's an, a very important um, issue to study because uh, Nicole, for example, that was the first one to study the cofradías, she found out great things. For example, the, 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 the way the, the women were involved in the cofradías, especially the Africans, the Afro, Africans and Afro-descendants. And we have, for example, I didn't bring it, but we have uh, uh, several pictures of Santa Ifigenia, the black uh, saint, and San Benito de Palermo, of course. Is it just more of a corporate identity or more an individual? Can you say something about that? I mean, before the, the rise of a concept of an individual act in the late 18th century? I, uh, again, again. Ah, uh -huh. yes, yes, well, I think that uh, that's very inter interesting because the identities were different in, in, in 17th and 18th century, you know, so sometimes you can see they join because they have uh, same kind of problems. It's not only a problem of race, you know. I think that problem of race, as I was saying, it's more of the 18th, 19th century, late 18 and beginning the, the, seven, the, the, the 19th century. So could you become black by joining a corporation that's typically considered belonging to a, to a, to a black community? Mm, maybe you, you, do, you can be in the, co in the cofradia if, you're, if it's not only of mulatos and black, you know, maybe there is a mestizo. And it was uh, very difficult, for example, for 18th century to distinguish who was whom. You can see, for example, in, in a demand of the Inquisition, 
that they say, this man that was black, and the other one say, well, not. He was really mulatto. No, I, I saw him and he was mestizo. In fact, for example, in a census of 18th century, they told them to distinguish the people in the census, which, which casta they were, blacks, indigenous, or mestizos. And I have a document uh, of the man that was making the census, that he say, I cannot do it because I go into a family house and one is black, the other is more mestizo, and the other it's, so how can I do it? You know, I cannot, uh, so that was the problem to, when the, the racial ideas came to Mexico, we were a mixed society. Not all of them, of course, I'm not saying we all were mixed, but the, it was difficult to find out. You can see in the amounts of, 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 of the way the mixing groups were uh, increasing. Can I, can I go back to the question you were asking something that came earlier? That's, that's a really neat piece. So it's about the small question. Like, how does the slave Yes, 1680. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was uh, not only me. They are, of course, we have a slave trade in the 18th century. For example, even in in the, in Hidalgo, in Pachuca. I was telling before um, uh, that uh, the El Conde de Regla, that he, become, he began to make a lot of, uh, of work of mines in Pachuca and San Miguel Regla, she, uh, he, he came with a lot of slaves in that place. They have a, a building of Regla, a black one. So we have in a lot of places, not so important like in 17th uh, century, but we have slave trade, of course. Ah, you're talking about Pacific. Yes, not so important, but we have, of course, of course, yes. And many of them may be by contraband, you know. This is Pacific, uh-huh, Pacific. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and we don't have really, really, that's a very important issue because we don't have really uh, research about Pacific uh, slave trade. We know some things, uh, Aguirre Beltran says some things, but we have a lot of things to, to work on it. The influence, we were talking yesterday in the dinner of the music of, uh, of Peru, of Ecuador, to, to the Costa Chica de Oaxaca and Guerrero, it is very important, and it explained it because we have to have, there were a lot of, uh, of, uh, of um, commerce between uh, the, the South by the Pacific. We have to know much more about the Pacific. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.